depths of your heart and your soul. But there is none like Him. Everything else, everyone else, falls short. He cannot compare. They cannot compare. He, she cannot compare. And we need to truly understand how awesome God is. He's truly worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our praise. He alone is worthy because He alone is who? He alone is God. He's worthy of our praise. So let's just, just, let's just sing this just one more time and then we will sit down. Well, let's just pour our heart out to Him.
to talk to you this morning for a little bit about God and the dysfunctional. So many times in our lives, as the church, as society, we have painted the perfect Christian family as being a family that everything goes smooth. Mom and dad, son, daughter, or two sons, two daughters, you know, every, everything is just perfectly matched. It's going perfectly well. And how many of y'all know that is a bunch of crap? <laughs> but yet we paint it anyway. Yet we proclaim it anyway. God of the dysfunctional. What is dysfunctional? Well, I have the, the definition right here. Dysfunctional means not performing normally. Okay? You, you, sort of, you see my picture here? How about you have that kind of table in your house? And it sets your, uh, your prized crystal or vase or lamp or whatever it is on, on this table. It, it, it would do an excellent job, wouldn't it? <laughs> you better get your balancing act now real good and get it on the corners, right? <laughs> Not performing normally. Having a malfunctioning part or element. Behaving or acting outside social norms. Now again, I, I am not here today to, to, to demonize what we consider to be normal or to or to really preach against a, a truly of truly having a, a wholesome family, of, of, it, of it truly being that uh, a man marries a woman and then they, 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 they when they fall in love and then they you know they, they, they wait till they're married to, to actually be husband and wife. You, you get my drift before they have sex and 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 they, then they have the children that that, that that the Lord will allow them, and they grow up and have and truly have the you know the the, the leave it to Beaver thing, you know, or um, Father knows best. You know, you know, this, some of you young you don't have the face idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> but, but, but you old ones in here like me, you sort of know what I'm talking about, don't you? All right. The biggest problem they dealt with on these shows is I have a pain now. What do I do about it? Now? Hmm. <laughs> I'm not here to demonize that. Because I know God truly wants the very best for us and our families and our children. I know that. But with that being said, we do have a lot of dysfunctionality in this world. Fact is, if you literally look at the life of Christ, and, and Shelly, as you were singing a song, and I saw coming, I realized what you were singing about. And I was thinking about this as I was getting this message together. Do you realize that Christ came from a dysfunctional family? You didn't know that, right? Christ came from a dysfunctional family? Who in here would disagree with me? How many of you know he did? He came from a dysfunctional family. The simple thing is, he was a half-brother. You know, his brothers and sisters were not his full brothers and sisters. He was the, because his dad wasn't Joseph. His mom was Mary. But his dad wasn't Joseph. His dad was who? The Almighty Father who, who was in heaven. The, 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 the God, the, God, the triune God who came down upon Mary who, who impregnated with, with his creative power. It caused, caused Jesus to be born in human flesh. Now Jesus, of course, Jesus existed before he was born. But that was his, his way to come in as human flesh through, through Mary. But yet he, he was born into a dysfunctional family. And I had actually dysfunctional people and families seem to be the norm today. Because of dysfunction in our lives, we feel that we cannot be as effective for God as we would like. Because, and the reason why is because, again, we painted this picture in the church that everything is supposed to be peachy keen. Everything's supposed to be cloud nine. And if it's not, then all of a sudden something's wrong with you and God truly can't use you. And I'm here to tell you that is the farthest thing from the truth that could ever be told to you. Because I have a question. I said, is this a true assessment 
of our situation? Of course, the answer is no. Can we be greatly used of God in spite of all of the messed up things and situations in our lives? And I'm here to tell you the answer is yes. So in order to address this topic today, I'm going to tell you a story. It's a story about love, weirdness, dysfunctionality. A long, long time ago, in a land far away, this young man fell in love with this very beautiful young girl. <coughs> Loved her so much he decided that he wanted, he wanted to marry her. Which, which, you know, which, which is a good thing, and, and her father had a business. He said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to prepare. I'm going to prepare for, for, for future life because I need to be able to make a living. So I'm going to work for her father. So he, he, goes, he goes to the dad. He says, if you know where I'm going with this, just shut up, okay? Uh, <laughs> he goes to her dad and says, hey, I want to marry your daughter, but here's what I'll do. Let me work in your company. He says, and so I can earn enough money that one day I, I, I can marry your daughter. The dad says, okay, that sounds fine. And as this guy's working, the company, real, I mean, the company, this guy was so good, this, this young man was so good that the company, it prospered beyond belief. And the dad was saying, wow, check this out. I mean, he's never, his possessions have never, his wealth has never grown so much. Of having this young guy overseeing his, his things. Then finally, the wedding day arrives. The wedding ceremony starts and everything's going fine and everything went off without a hitch. So it seemed. The next morning he wakes up and he finds the woman laying beside him. It's not the woman he married. It was another woman. And he literally begins to freak out. How would you like to be in that situation? I'd like to have that. <laughs> Hopefully neither. He finds himself in a situation that the person he thought he married is not the person he ends up waiting next to. It's another woman. And like I said, he begins to freak out. Come to find out, it was his boss's idea. Because his boss realizes that, you know what? Man, he's made me a lot of money. He's made me wealthy, so, so he has to plan. And he, and he goes to me and he says, I'll tell you what, here's what I'll do. Now remember, I told you, this was a land in a long, long time ago in a land far away. Okay? So he goes to the guy. He says, here's, here's what I'll do. He says, I'll tell you what. He says, why don't you work for me a little bit longer? Let's just say about the same amount of time you worked for me before. And I will give you the one you love also because the woman he gave her was his other daughter. And you're like, what? That shit's sick. <laughs> so now all of a sudden, this is this is the proposal he makes to this young man. He says, look, he says, work for me a little bit longer. He says, and I will give you my daughter that you love so much you can have both of them. So what's the young man, what does he do? He does it. How stupid's that? <laughs> So he works and, and he and he works and he takes the other wife and, and as time is going on, he's, he's working now for his father-in-law because the father has this idea, I'm going to get wealthy off this guy because he made me wealthy, he's going to make me even more wealthy. And, and this guy, he goes along with the idea. So now he has two sisters that are both, their, that both of them are his wives and, and they, they begin to have children. Well, the, the, the one he married first began to have children and the other one couldn't. So the other one had a brilliant idea. She says, you know what? My dad had blessed me, you know, he gave me uh, uh, this person that was with me all my life because our family got wealthy. So he gave me this personal assistant I'm very, very close to. So she goes to her husband and says, you know what? Here's what I want you to do. I can't have kids. And my sister's having more me, and I don't like that. But since my friend is so close, but my assistant's so close, I want you to go marry her, and I'll have children through her, and they'll be representing me when you do the her. So you know what this, this guy, this is the proposal she makes to her husband. You know what he does? He does it. He marries the assistant. Has sex with her. Guess what? She gets pregnant. And also now his children are born. So now, not, not only did he have two wives, now he has three wives. The two of the wives are claiming a child as being their own. 
I mean, it, it, it's a mess. Well, the older sister sees what's going on and she has a brainstorm. I have a personal assistant too. Can't let my younger one outdo me, so she goes to her husband, hey, you know, I have an idea. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to marry my personal assistant. And again, these children be part of, of my, of my, you know, of me and also because we're so close. She says, he says, what do you think? You know what he does? He does it. He marries her. Now, he has four wives. And then finally, the, 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 the sister he normally loved and wanted to marry, she finally then has children after the other three do. So now he has four wives with children from four different wives. I'm talking, you were talking about a man, you see me bald, he had to be completely utterly <laughs> all gone here by that time. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is what this is one messed up situation. You think the story's pretty weird so far? Yeah. Hey, it has to, it's only about to get weirder. His oldest son. His oldest son, one day. This man finds out that you know his oldest son ends up sleeping with his second wife's personal assistant. Which is a woman he's married, which a woman that the man's married to, not the son. And then another son of his ends up having sex with his own daughter-in-law. Talk about being sort of dysfunctional, huh? And you know the funny thing about it is? The story I'm telling you is true. In fact, how in the world could God ever use a family like this? Watch this clip. Did you get what I was telling you? We're talking about being dysfunctional. Saw some of the names up there, didn't you? Saw Noah, Moses, Peter, Paul, David, Solomon. It might know who Rahab, Rahab was. Anybody know who Rahab is? Well, it's told you Rahab was a prostitute, but Rahab, you know, Rahab uh, she was a prostitute, but you know, she was also in the lineage of Jesus. You know that, right? In the lineage of King David. Of being a prostitute. The story, like I said, the story I shared with you is truly about an individual in the Bible. Anybody know the name of the guy I was telling you about? Jacob. Who? Jacob. Jacob. A guy named Jacob. Jacob, if anybody doesn't know who Jacob is in the Bible, Jacob, his name was later changed to Israel. He is the namesake of the whole nation and the whole people of Israel. The Jews. They all come from Jacob. He, he is the namesake for that entire nation and this is the mess that happened in his life 
this is what was going on. And this, this is a man, you know, I'm, I'm going to get a portion of scripture here. This is a man who um, um, God said he would bless very greatly. In fact, if you want to read the whole account of Jacob's life, because again, I put this in a lot of my swing. I, I probably embellished some things a little bit, but not really too much. It, 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 I, real pretty, I held pretty true to the, the story. I just tried to mix it up a little bit to sort of throw a, 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 an angle at you so hopefully you didn't discover it too quickly. Uh, but you can find out about the account of Jacob in Genesis chapters 32 through 50. And that deals with him and his family. A lot of mess happened to that family. A lot of mess happened because a lot of times we never get into what God needs to do. And we try to do it our way, we find ourselves in trouble. But God can still use us anyway. Like that little video clip showed us, you know, our past sometimes will try to come up and bite us in the rear end. It'll try to throw us for a loop. It'll try to stop us from accomplishing what God wants us to accomplish. And we need to understand is that nobody in the Bible except for Jesus was perfect. God used them in spite of the faults and failures. Now again, I'm not making excuses for the faults and failures, so I want you to plainly understand that. So I'm not telling you to go out there and do whatever you want and just say, well, God, I'm going to do this and you go ahead and use me anyway. That, that's not what I'm telling you either. Okay? But what I am telling you is that if you do have messages, if you have failures and all this stuff, God can do something miraculous with your life. And I said, don't get me wrong, because there's a lot of things that happen because of all this dysfunction. But God being God is able to take all of this junk, mess and dysfunction, and use it for His glory, plan and will. But we just have to be willing, what? To be used of God. Like I said, I'm not telling you to go out and live your life haphazardly and, and just say, you know, I'm going to do whatever, and, you know. But, but, but we, we need to strive as much as we can to live for Him, but just because we do mess up, because our family might be messed up, it doesn't mean we can't be mildly used of God. We have to learn to trust and obey Him. In fact, here's what we find out in Genesis 35, verses 9 through 12. It says, Now that Jacob had returned from Padad, Padad, Padad Aram, God appeared to him again at Bethel. That name sound familiar to you? appeared to him at Bethel. God blessed him, saying, Your name is Jacob, but you will not be called Jacob any longer. From now on, your name will be Israel. So God renamed him Israel. Then God said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. You will become a great nation, many nations, even many nations. Kings will be among your descendants, and I will give you the land I once gave to Abraham and Isaac. Yes, I will give it to you and your descendants after you. So again, here's this guy with all of this mess. He, pretty much a lot of the stuff I was telling you about happened before these verses here. But even before these verses here, God appeared to him for all this stuff happened and told him he was going to be with him and he was going to bless him. The reason why Jacob prospered so much for his father-in-law or the man who's going to be his father-in-law is because God put his blessing on him. And yet Jacob didn't fully realize all of this about God and who and what God wanted to do because here's what we know about Jacob. See, God told him you were originally given the name Jacob, which means deceiver and cheater. And you know what? He was very good at his name. <laughs> Jacob was excellent at fulfilling what his name meant of being a deceiver and a cheater. He deceived his brother and cheated his brother out of his birthright, out of his blessings. I mean, you know, he, 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 was, he was a slick dude. Now, again, I won't give Jacob all the credit for being that deceitful. He went along with it, but his mama was along the road with him, too, telling him to do the stuff. But that's another subject for another time. But Jacob, you know, his name, his name means deceiver and cheater. But God told me, he says, I'm now going to, I'm going to rename you Israel, which means prince of God. Which means a prince of God. Which means no longer are you going to be a cheater or a deceiver, a manipulator, but you're going to be, as I'm calling you, a prince of God, a prince of mine. 
It's not who he used to be, but who we all can be and are with God in control of your life and future. It doesn't matter what is going on, but if you give your life over to God, he's able to take it and make something great out of it. Because I want to show it to you, because this is what the Bible declares for us in some of these verses. See, we see this in, in the life of Jacob, and Jacob truly does. He grow, he, you know, as life goes on, he is, he's the father of the now nation of Israel, which at one time a day, under King David especially, King David, King Solomon, they ruled a pretty large empire. That was the golden era of the kingdom of Israel. And they were a mighty nation. They were a nation to be reckoned with. In fact, David, King David, anytime he went out against any army, he won. He kicked their tails. He couldn't be beat. And it wasn't because David was truly such a mighty warrior in himself, which he was, but it was because he had the blessings of the Almighty God on him. Because he was a man that the Bible tells us in the New Testament that God, God himself testified of David. This is a man after my own heart. And because of that, it opened up God and it opened up God freely to come in and truly bless David the way that he could bless no one else because David truly pursued God with everything that was in him. Now again, as you read it, you, you saw in the video that David came in and David had messed up soon. We, and we may deal with that in a little bit in the future. But we're talking about Jacob. So Jacob has all this dysfunction running in his family. You might be here today and your family might, might be comprised of, you might be on your second, third, fourth, tenth marriage. Who knows? Hopefully not. But, but, but I mean, ten. <laughs> but you know, unfortunately, life happens. Sometimes things happen that are beyond our control. Sometimes things happen that we have complete control of and we do it stupidly anyway. Jacob. And he did. You know, these things, I mean, how just he just listened and did. These things that just cause, again, these things cause a lot of mess in his life. But it didn't stop God from sitting there telling him. He says, says I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a mighty nation. I'm going to do something great through you. But like I said, when we give ourselves over to the Lord that's, and give God control of our lives and future, then God can begin to do some things. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, one of Jacob's sons utters this phrase to his brothers. Fact is, Jacob, or Israel, had a favorite son, and, and it was a guy named Joseph. And I'm not going to take time to get into all this, but Je Joseph, Joseph, um, Joseph was hated by his brothers, sold as a slave, and ends up becoming the, the head of all of Egypt. And now his brothers are, you know, they, they, they come through, they find out who he is and all this. Everybody's down, down in Egypt, and everything's going well, and their father finally dies. His brothers are afraid that, J that Joseph now is going to get revenge on them for how they treated him when he was younger. And Joseph basically says, don't worry about it. Because here's what Joseph says in verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. So even though all this dysfunction is going on, God was able to take all this dysfunction, move, move all the pieces around that he needed to move around the world. He could still fulfill the promise that he was talking to Jacob about, about making Jacob a strong and a mighty nation, and that kings would come from him. But Joseph says, he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. That's, here, that's to let you know that no matter what is going on in your life, God is able to take it and change it. And turn it around for your better. And I'm pretty sure I have this verse in here. But, but in Romans 8, 28, we read this. What? For we know that all things work together for the good of them who love God and are the called according to His purpose. Not your purpose, not your desire, not your design. But we know that all things, that the, so it doesn't matter what type of tragedy is going on, it doesn't matter what kind of mess is going on in your life, if you truly keep your eyes upon the Lord, He's able to take it and turn it around for your good, make it for your better. Now again, I don't know how he does it, but that's not up for me to know. Because I'm not God. It's not up for me to fulfill, because I'm not God. That's up for him to do. Because he's the one who said it, he's the one who inspired Paul to write it. So he's the one responsible to have to take, take, take the ability and take the knowledge and wisdom that he has to make it come about in our lives. But he says, you know, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus tells us this. He says, 
The thief's purpose is to kill, to still kill and destroy. In other words, all this stuff that's going on, the enemy wants to literally do what to you? He wants to destroy you. He wants to ruin you. He don't want you to fulfill what God has for you. He doesn't want you to live the life that God wants you to live. He wants you to, to, to fall this way. He wants all these things, all this dysfunction that is in your life, all of these uh, shortcomings, all of these failures, He wants them to, to, to well up and just become a thing where you break and it kills you and ruins you. That, that is His desire. But Jesus, He doesn't end there. He continues and says, He says, but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Jesus come to give you a life that is truly worth it living. He says the enemy came to destroy you. The enemy, that's what I'm saying to you know, people, especially Christians that mess around with things that they know it's not of God. Sometimes you just want to whack them upside the head and say, what are you doing? It's not good for you, but yet, again, being like Jacob. Yes, dear. Okay. Become a mighty man and a mighty woman of God and be able to tell the devil no. Again, and I, I know we're not all successful in that. And, and then there's a lot of times we fail, but we need to understand that God truly has our best interest at heart. But we need to realize that the enemy, he's there to destroy us. He does not want us to prosper what God has for us. But Jesus, like I said, he said, he said, but my purpose is to give them a rich, a rich and a satisfying life. In Isaiah 59, 19, the Bible tells us, so they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west, and His glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes, and the main part of folks, the last part of this verse, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. In other words, when Satan comes against you with everything that he has, you can look at this verse two different ways. I know the punctuation there is actually after the flood, but I heard one Bible scholar talk that in, in, in actual um, Jewish writing, that type of punctuation doesn't exist. So, 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 this, so this actual verse here could, could be read like this. When the enemy comes in, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. But either way, even if the enemy is coming in with everything that he has like a flood, the bottom line is God will lift up what a form of it will not overtake you. So even when all of this mess is coming against you, you need to understand God still has your best interest at heart. He still will lift up a way. He will still make a way possible where you will make it through. Whether it's him that will bring in the flood or the enemy bring in the flood, it doesn't matter. God will see you through. And of course, I already read Romans 8, 28. And we know that God calls us everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are the call according to them, the purpose for that, to His purpose for that. No matter what is going on in your life, God will, is able to take and turn it around for your good and for your betterment. So all of this mess and all this dysfunction that is going on, I'm here to tell you, you can't let it weigh you down. You can't let it stop you from fulfilling what God has in store for you. In fact, I have one more little video clip I want to show you, and then I'm going to ask the, the musicians to come after that, and I'm going to close the message this morning with the portion of Scripture and the thought. But this one here is, first off, it's, it's one of my favorite portions of Scripture from, from, from a, a worldly movie. Some great biblical truth can be pulled out of this movie. And the movie is The Lion King. I know I've showed you some of this clip before. I'm going to show it to you again. It's one of these things that just sort of speaks. It speaks about the greatness of God. That's not my father. It's just my reflection. No. Look hard. You see, he lives in you. No. How could I? You have 
have forgotten who you are and so forgotten me. Look inside yourself, Selma. You are more than what you have become. You must take your place in the circle of life. How can I go back? I'm not who I used to be. Remember who you are. You are my son and the one true king. Father! like the winds are changing. Ah, uh, change is good. Yeah, but it's not easy. I know what I have to do, but going back means I'll have to face my past. I've been running from it for so long. Ow! Jeez, what was that for? It doesn't matter. It's in the past. <laughs> yeah, but it still hurts. Oh, yes, the past can hurt. But the way I see it, you can either run from it or Learn from it. Ah! You see? So what are you going to do? First, I'm gonna take your stick. No, 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 no! Not a stick! Hey! Where are you going? I'm going back! That is one of my favorite video clips. But there's a lot of truth act in that video clip. A lot of truth. We're talking about being dysfunctional, which I know many of us fall into that. But we look at society's definition of being dysfunctional. Many of us in this place today fall into that category. And because of that, many times, as the video clip said, we have forgotten who we are. We have forgotten who we belong to. We have forgotten who we serve. We have forgotten who's truly in control of all things who is truly the one who has the last say. Because as we saw a seminar, he allowed his past to dominate his life. And the way it appeared until Rafiki came into the scene, it was going to dominate his future. If you're not careful, the same thing will happen. You allow your past to override what God has in store for you so much that it will dominate the life you're living right now. And it will dominate any future that you think you have. And you will think that is your future instead of truly realizing that you are a child of the Lord. You belong to Him now. You have now, as we read at the beginning of the service, He has given you right standing with Him through your faith in Him. Jesus Christ. Through the salvation you have in Jesus, you now have been made right with Him. But so many times we, we allow our past to get a hold of us and hold us back. And like I said, we forget who we are, who we belong to, and forget that He is the one living inside of us. And truly, if we look in the mirror, we should be able to see what God dwelling in us. But many times we don't because we allow our past to dominate our life. We allow the dysfunction of what has happened. We allow all these things that have gotten a hold of us and that has happened to us to weigh us down and tear us down instead of truly realizing who we are in the Lord. See, your past is exactly that. Your past. I could do an object lesson here today like they did in the video. I could take this box, whack Will inside his head and say, hey, what'd you do that for? I'll say, it doesn't matter. Why? Yeah, yeah you're not getting good. There's nothing you can ever do to change what you've already done. No matter how much you try, no matter if you think you're Sam Beckett on Quantum Leap, 
I'm claiming this, I'm declaring it in my life, and I'm not letting it go because I know you are the faithful one. You are the one that there is nothing that's impossible for. And because of that, I can stand upon your word and know that everything in my life will somehow, in some way, turn out the way it's supposed to. See, not the way we think, not the way we envision, but the way he envisions it. Here's what the word tells us. This one portion of scripture, I, I've used it a lot over the past four years. But it's John 8 36. If the Son sets you free, you are truly free. There's some people in this place this morning that need to be reminded, that needs to, be, that needs to hear again, and you need to understand, you need to grab a hold of this like you never grabbed a hold of it before. You need to say, when you ask Jesus Christ into your heart and your life, you have been set free. Your past no longer has any hold on you. What has happened in your past is your past. You can't change it. But you need to walk in the freedom that Jesus has given you. He alone has the one who has the power to do it. Don't let your past hold you back and drag you down. Go forth in the future he has for you. Stand in the freedom. Live in the freedom he's given you and he's declared over you. Good. Not for 
Not for what? Not for what? What the thief comes to kill, still destroy. But I come to give you life and give it to you what more richly, more fully, more satisfying, more holy, more complete. To give you a to give you what? What's God want you to have? What does God want you to have? Come on, reach out and claim it. What does God want you to have? A future. And what? A hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find out what is he telling you? Come looking for me, what's going to happen? You're fighting. Common sense, right? Makes sense. I will be found by you, says the Lord. And now listen to what it says here. And I will end your captivity. In other words, the hold that the devil had on you, he's going to literally take it and scrape it loose, strip it apart, and tear it apart, and get it off of you and tear it away. It's talking about a full and abundant life that is found in Jesus Christ. I don't care what is going on in your life. You get your eyes upon the Lord. You call out to Him. You call on His name. You trust in Him. You seek Him with everything that is in you. He will destroy your captivity. He will end it. And He will restore your purpose. And He says, and I will gather you out of the nations where you were sent. And I will bring you home again to your homeland. He's other words, He's telling us again where Jesus says, I am going to prepare place for you, that where I am there you may be also. See, God has our best interest at heart. He's the one that has the greatest retirement plan there is. He is the one that is preparing a home for us that the world cannot take away, that the enemy cannot destroy, because it is rooted and grounded solely in him, upon the faithfulness of who Jesus Christ is, through the life that he lived, the death that he died, and the resurrection which he was raised to. And because he lived, we do have the hope of everlasting life. It is found in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. And as long as we keep our eyes upon Him, there is nothing we can do. As we read in Philippians 4, it says, I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Captivity that you said I have. 
Because as the pastor said, you said, God, you have a plan for me. You have a plan for me. And if that's you this morning, will you step out and receive the Lord? Do it as an act of obedience. Do it as an act of faith. Come up and just begin to touch her, Lord. Gee, you don't need me. I mean, you don't need me to come by and pray for you. This is the thing to say, Lord, Pastor said in the message today, and I want what he was talking about this morning. I want this freedom. I want this restoration. I want this deliverance. I want this, this thing in my life. I don't want to be held back by the dysfunction, by all this mess and all this junk. My past is no longer going to rule me. I'm going to step into the plan of the future. You've had a way. Just begin to talk to him. Say, Lord, I want it. And if that's all you say, that'll be enough. Lord, I want it. Lord, I want it. I want it. And I receive it. I claim it. I take it. I'm not preaching, name it, claim it. That's because I don't always understand it. But what do you say, Lord? I'm standing upon your word. And I receive what you promised in your word today. I make it a part of my life. I take it from you. Dear Blessed Heavenly Father,